Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This session we will discuss the pathology of glomerulonephritis. We have already gone through the structure and function of the nephron and the most important component of nephron is the glomerulus. And uh, now we will discuss that how alteration of the structure of the glomerulus secondary to different diseases alters the glomerular function that leads to the different kind of clinical syndrome and the clinical presentation of these cases. The basis of the renal pathology always is to correlate the clinical syndrome or clinical features with the pathology. What we are seeing under microscope and demonstrating by additional tests like immunofluorescence and uh, electron microscopy. And sometimes also we investigate these cases for their serological abnormality like the uh, different uh, markers of infection, autoimmune diseases and so on. Because as I uh, discussed in my initial introduction that the glomeruli may be involved with both the primary diseases involving them as well as the different systemic diseases. I think with this introduction what we will do in this session is that go for first to look in the what are the different kind of clinical presentation of these glomerulonephritis and then we will go for the, the classification of glomerulonephritis on the basis of the structural abnormality or alteration. because. I will be discussing from the pathology perspective and then we will see that what are their features. The clinical presentation of all the glomerulonephritis are uh, mainly uh, initially they can present as a nephrotic syndrome, they can present as a acute nephritis or nephritic syndrome and also they can present in a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or sometimes this is called a rapidly progressive renal failure kind of presentation. And I think the nephrotic syndrome is typical with a heavy proteinuria uh, 3.5 gram uh, in 24 hours. It is accompanied by generalized edema, hypoalbuminemia, hyperlipidemia and sometimes lipiduria. These are the typical features where the nephrotic uh, uh, syndrome patients present in the OPD. Whereas, in cases of nephritic syndrome, these patients have uh, relatively shorter duration of the illness and uh, they present with uh, um, mild to moderate proteinuria and hematuria. And when the glomerular hematuria is there with proteinuria, obviously this is related to some glomerulonephritis associated with uh, azotemia and as well as hypertension. Whereas, in rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or RPGM, they present a shorter history and uh, for few days to few weeks and they present with features of acute renal failure, sometimes with uh, no urine formation or anuria, sometimes reduction of the urine formation below 400 ml per day which we described as oliguria and as well as there may be hematuria, may be mild proteinuria. So, when patients present with these different kind of syndrome, then we try to explore that what will be the pathology in the kidney if we get the kidney biopsy from this patient. Now, as I told you that from the glomerulus point of view, we can uh, classify the different types of glomerulonephritis on the basis of structural abnormality. So, for that first we can see that what are the non-proliferative glomerulonephritis. That means, here there is no proliferation of any component of the glomerular cells but at the same time there is abnormality of their structure and function which leads to this different clinical presentation. 
Now, under the non-proliferative pneumonephritis, the broad or the main types are minimal change disease, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis and membranous pneumonephritis. So, these three. <coughs> so, first we will see that what happens in these three conditions. The first one is the minimal change disease. This is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. So, this is very important. If you go to the pediatric OPD in uh, of the kidney diseases, then you see that majority of these children they present with uh, the nephrotic syndrome. 10 to 15 percent of the nef nephrotic syndrome in adults. So, adults it is much less and this is the third common after the membranous mononephritis and FSGS. So, in adult the commonest thing are not the minimal change disease and it is more common in, in Hispanic, Asian, Arabs and Caucasians. This is international perspective and the clinical and pathological entity defined by the selective proteinuria and the hypoalbuminemia that occurs in absence of cellular glomerular infiltrates or immunoglobulin deposits. So, basically minimal change disease if you can remember the term itself it is explanatory. There is hardly any change in routine light microscopic examination in the glomeruli and also when you do immunofluorescence test there is no immune complex deposit. Now, so this is the light microscopy. Now, if you see the uh, this is a, a glomerulus and uh, looking completely normal. Uh, see the this is the uh, glomerular uh, capillaries with very pliable wall. This is the endothelial cells and this is uh, visceral epithelial cells and between the capillaries there are mesangium and in the mesangium up to 3 cells are normal. So, they, they are up to 2 to 3 cells. So, they are all normal mesangium and uh, so basically when you see under electron microscopy also light microscopy there is no change that is why we told minimal change disease or no change disease. But the changes can be seen in the light in, in the electron microscope. If you see in the electron microscope this is one of the capillary wall in high power and you can see this is the glomerular basal membrane and these are the fenestrated endothelial cells. On the other side we are supposed to see the porocytes. You see the all the porocytes this total effacement of the food processes and in fact there is denudation of these uh, food processes also and there are small areas where you can see this kind of microvilla structure. These are the typical changes that means in this disease this is abnormality of the food processes as well as the Podocytes. So, that is why the minimal change disease is also termed as one of the important podocytopathy. Now, the other important issue is that there is no electron dense deposit in the glomerular capillary wall. Electron dense deposit indicates the immune complex deposit. So, in this disease there is no immune complex deposit that is why under electron microscopy we do not see any dense deposits. So, this is this is the comparison between normal and the minimal gene disease. You can see this is the normal one and uh, this is the capillary side endothelial cells, this is the, the podocytes and these are the food processes. In between the food processes you have got slit pore membrane and the food processes are uniformly distributed with uniform appearance of the slit pores. Whereas, if you see here this kind of changes we describe at effacement of the food processes where all these food processes they fuse together like this. And the slit pore membrane also hardly you can see there is loss of slit pore membrane and only few you can detect somewhere. So, this is a typical change example of what we see in minimal change disease pathology. Now, we, we ask that why these things happen, what are the factors which leads to this kind of changes in the porocyte. Till today it is not very clear, it's still we exactly do not know the, the cause of the minimal change disease or uh, in some cases we know, but majority cases we do not know. So, there are hereditary components that is why nephrotic syndrome in the Finnish populations in a particular genotype you can have more. There may be autosomal recessive steroidase and nephrotic syndrome. Familial form of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis initially can present as a minimal change disease. There may be other relatively rare syndromes and uh, like nail patella syndrome, Dennis Dress syndrome. So, basically these can initially present as minimal change disease, but actual some of the understanding of the molecular mechanism of the minimal ch change disease is now we know. I think we will go to that, but it is for majority of the cases we exactly do not know the cause.
the molecular um, anatomy of the protocyte food process cytoskeleton. As you can see here, there are these structural component of the food processes, they mainly effectin and uh, the synaptoporin, but the more important proteins are which maintain the slit pore membrane structure. So, they are these nephrin, protocin, CD2 AP. So, if there is abnormality in this gene which actually um, is responsible for maintaining this protein. So, obviously, you get an abnormality of the slit pore membrane and followed by the heavy proteinuria and typical minimal change disease. So, that is why there are the genetic causes of these uh, minimal change disease associated with the food process abnormality. Now, so this is the intrinsic factor we talked about. Now, there are also several extrinsic factors which are described associated with minimal change disease. The example are the experimental observations which you can refer to say T cell hybridoma when it is produced in mouse model that leads to heavy proteinuria. So, that means the may be T cell activity is also related to development of minimal change disease. Then removal of the glomerular permeability factor. So, there it was described, but we do not know that what exactly that factor that sometimes reduces the degree of proteinuria. So, so that is why there is a huge group of uh, authors or investigator they initially thought that probably this circulating factor has a link with the T cell response and the glomerular disease. But then there are certain clinical observation based on uh, hypothesis like the Salov uh, hypothesis that MC, MCD frequently remit with measles infection it is seen in the children we do not know how it happens and corticosteroid and alkylating drug causes a remission also. So, that means the immunosuppuration causes reversal of the, the proteinuria and also regeneration of the food processes in certain percentage of the cases which are not steroid resistant. But the group of disease which does not respond to corticosteroid or other alkylating drug there this kind of regeneration does not uh, take place. So, that is why this is a multifactorial disease some of the factors we understand and many other factors we do not understand. Finally, they give rise to a abnormality of the protocyte and leading to a condition where light microscopically the glomeruli look totally normal. Electron microscopically we can demonstrate the food process abnormality, immunofluorescence microscopy does not show any immune complex deposit and we diagnose them as minimal change disease. So, this is the summary of what I talked about. The synonyms are nil disease, lipoid nephrosis or food process diseases. So, obviously, food process disease incidence 80 percent of the nephrotic syndrome in children 1 to 8 years mostly in male and adult it is usually second and third decade incidence is much lower. Etiology it is idiopathic. The uh, there is a some abnormality in the protocyte the charges and the capillary based membrane charges. Clinical features already we have discussed and the lab features there is selective proteinuria. Now, what is selective proteinuria? In initially when minimal change disease uh, the patient comes to the OPD with the milder changes in the in the protocyte food processes. If you collect the urine and do a electro urine electrophoresis you will see that there is mostly only albumin coming into the urine because albumin molecular weight is about uh, 69 kd. So, basically the globulins are much larger protein. So, initially abnormality of these food process in minimal change disease only cause selective albuminuria and not associated with larger molecular weight globulin. But as the disease progresses and then obviously, this selectivity goes off. This is not a very sensitive that is why sensitive method to diagnose MCD. So, only urine examination cannot help us to definitely tell it is suffering from MCD we have to see, see the biopsy. Now, the pathology I told you already it is a normal light microscopically in the clinical course they, they spontaneously uh, undergo remission in 25 to uh, 40 percent of these cases and uh, spontaneous I mean hardly anything significant immunosuppression is needed. Complete remission occurs in 65 to 70 percent of the patients uh, with steroid, but there are steroid resistant patients also and which progresses to next phase of the disease and most of them they evolve into focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Now, we come to the next group of non proliferative glomerular disease that is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. The focal segmental glomerular sclerosis in a, a large uh, percentage of cases we do not know the cause and it is uh, renal limited. So, this is the primary and idiopathic category 
and the clinical features they usually present with the uh, nephrotic syndrome with edema, hypoalbuminemia and hypertension is more common in this group of disease in comparison to minimal chance disease and hematuria can be seen 30 to 50 percent of these cases and in, in a progressive disease finally, the patient develop also increase in serum creatinine level uh, indicating renal insufficiency. Now, the histological type now the if we get this biopsy of the cases of the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis on histologically we can have these following types of variant. So, the, the classical focal segmental glomerulosclerosis will have a one segment of the, the uh, capillaries which show you the sclerosis or fibrosis. Uh, I told you that the basically each glomerulus has 6 to 11 capillary loops and out of which if some of the capillary loops undergoing the sclerosis and others are still intact then that is a segmental lesions and there we, we tell that this is a focal uh, the segmental glomerular sclerosis and if it is less than 50 percent glomerular involved in fact less than 50 percent I should not say if some of the glomerular are involved uh, 50 percent cutoff is sometimes not very accurate one. So, then the we say that this is a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Now, the classical type there is significant abnormality. So, that is why we say if, if FSGS or FGS NOS mm, not otherwise specified. Then we get another variant which is called collapsing variant and here what happens a segment of these capillary loop they undergo collapse due to the hypertrophy and proliferation of the visceral epithelial cells. Now, this is a very very specific subtype of the focal segmental glomerular sclerosis because they have a more acute course shorter duration and also poor prognosis they do not respond to uh, the uh, immunosuppressive therapy and they are associated with uh, progressive renal failure and they also present with heavy proteinuria. Then it, there is another variant which is described as the tip variants. The tip of the glomerulus near the proximal tubule show you the segmental sclerosis. Now, this variant is prognostically very good. In fact, among all the variants of FSGS, the tip variant usually does not progress towards renal failure and they behave in a much more benign way. So, that is why when we try to diagnose FSGS, if there is tip variant, we always mention it very clearly. Then there is the next variant that is perihilar variant, perihilar term is explanatory. In these conditions, the sclerotic segments are at the site of the hilum of these uh, the glomerulus I mean where the afferent and efferent arteriole enters into the glomerulus. And obviously, the next is the another variant which we described as cellular variant it is a very rare variant and that is why it is little controversial, but for a for a theoretical uh, class I should mention that one variant is described which is known as cellular variant and this is present at least one glomerulus with segmental endocapillary hypercellularity and that occurs include the capillary lumen. That means, there you can get some amount of hypercellularity in a segmental nature along with sclerosis, but I have a feeling that the this cellular variant is still controversial and we may not actually pay much heed to this variant this is extremely rare also. So, this is the histology the this one I have shown you the normal glomerulus like the one which I showed you minimal chain disease it is normal light microscopically. Here if you see capillary loops in this uh, area segment is totally sclerosed and you can see that there is fusion of the loop with hyalinosis and fibrosis and on the other side it is totally normal. And so, this is a, a typical segmental sclerosis and uh, if you come to this side you see there is these, uh, uh, these capillary loops which are actually collapsed together along with these are the visceral epithelial cells which are all swollen up and they are increase in number proliferated. So, this is a typical of these uh, collapsing glomerulopathy and here this is the hilum and this is the proximal tubule and in the apex of this proximal tubule you can see this segment is showing you sclerosis as well as there is foam cell infiltration. There can be also foam cell infiltration in that segment of these uh, glomerulus which is undergoing hyalinosis and sclerosis. So, like here, so basically this one obviously we will tell tip lesions, this one we will say collapsing glomerulopathy and this one we will say the FSGS NOS. Now, the etiology most of the cases we do not know the cause and that is why we say it is primary, but there are many situations where it is associated with other diseases. Now, these we classify as secondary FSGS, now they may be associated with AIDS, 
the autoimmune I mean the HIV uh, where the collapsing glomerulopathy is a, a is an important or common presentation. In diabetes mellitus we can get FSGS, Febreze disease, Sarcotomary tooth disease these are the rare genetic disease we can have uh, focal segment sclerosis. And then there may be persistent glomerular capillary hypertension that can leads to the FSGS and we can see the FSGS with decompensated hypertension cases also. Then there are congenital disease like oligonephropathy or megalonephronemia and even the solitary kidney that can lead to FSGS and the acquired nephron loss like the surgery if one kidney is removed then the remaining kidney they can develop the FSGS. You see one of the etiopathogenesis of FSGS is that if there is a continuous hyperperfusion in the glomeruli then obviously these glomeruli are more tend to develop the porocyte injury and followed by segmental sclerosis and that is why in a very obese individual where the glomerular perfusion is increased because of increase in body weight and the surface area those may uh, the individual may also tend to develop FSGS and so that is also one of the cause and that is why acquired nephron loss can give rise to this disease. And there are other diseases like sickle cell nephropathy and heroin addict they also can have FSGS. Now from FSGS now we move to another non-proliferative glomerulonephritis that is membranous glomerulonephritis. This is uh, uh, the other terms which are used earlier I think they are not popular now is epimembranous glomerulonephritis, extramembranous glomerulonephritis. Usually they are very common in adult and usual age range is 40 to 60 years old and etiology they are immune complex mediated disease. So and uh, they idiopathic in many of these cases and sometimes they are associated with infection and the drugs and carcinomas and as well as they may be associated with heavy metal um, um, poisoning or toxicity. Now clinically majority of them present as a nephrotic syndrome and asymptomatic proteinuria is seen in 20 percent of these cases and in a smaller subset of cases they may be associated with some microscopic hematuria but major presentation is the nephrotic syndrome. And here there is non-selective proteinuria because as I explained to you only albuminuria comes in a mild porocytic damage here the basement membrane changes or damage is quite marked and that is why you get a massive proteinuria, non-selective proteinuria and the pathology is that there is diffuse uniform basement membrane thickening with sub epithelial projection in the form of spikes. I, I think the this is the past stain I think they we, we can better see them in the silver methanamine stain and there is a diffuse coarse granular the IgG and C3 deposits this we see under immunofluorescence microscope and if we do the electron microscope like here on the small uh, this diagram you can see there is a lot of these electron dense deposit disease and these deposits are classically present in the sub epithelial site. They, they, are, they are near the porocyte and the porocytes also show you the secondary changes of effacement of food process and, and all other changes. So the, the prognosis usually in children it is good but in adults usually some of them are progressive and develop the end stage renal disease and exclusion of other diseases is also required. If from these uh, minimal change uh, disease we have FSGS which are not associated with immune complex disease immune complex deposition we have come to a situation of membranous glomerulonephritis where there is the immune complex deposition. So we will be now discussing about how immune complex deposition causes the abnormality or pathology in the glomerulus. So for that we can have a very simplified uh, the concept. See the immune, immune mechanism of the glomerular injury. Now this injury can be antibody mediated and how the antibody can be there in the glomerulus. So it may be secondary to in situ immune complex deposition in situ means in the glomerulus itself. Now how it can get deposited in the glomerulus it can be of two types on so, the fixed intrinsic tissue antigen that means inside the glomerulus these uh, the antigens which are auto antigen or self antigen they, they uh, self, self uh, the, uh, the substance they can be antigenic and that is a like autoimmune response and this is described particularly in NC1 non collagenous domain and Hyman antigen membranous glomerulonephritis it is the, the animal version of this glomerulonephritis. Now the, the there may be mesangial antigen and recently we have described these uh, the phospholipase A2 receptor uh, the 
uh, antigen and antibody against that which is very important for pathogenesis of the membranous nephritis. Now, there may be planted antigen also like exogenous infection agent and drug like hepatitis B viral infection you can have hepatitis B viral antigen planted in the glomerulus capillary wall and which can lead to even membranous glomerulonephritis. Now, endogenous antigen may be there like DNA a nuclear protein this we see in systemic lupus erythematosus we, we will be uh, seeing that in glomerulonephritis associated with systemic diseases where uh, this uh, the anti DNA antibody and other thing can be deposited. Then there may be circulating immune complex deposition like endogenous antigen this can happen in a situation like uh, systemic lupus erythematosus or in case of tumor antigen in case of the, the different kind of malignancy. But exogenous antigens this is very important cause of pathogenesis in case of uh, the post infectious glomerulonephritis. we will come to that where the streptococcal infection particularly can uh, lead to circulating immune complexes which can get deposited in the glomeruli producing uh, then immune mediated injury. Now, there may be cytotoxic antibody also and there may be cell mediated injury of the glomerular structure and activation of the alternative complement pathway. The complement mediated injury is coming uh, is much much um, highlighted and uh, we have the newer classification of these uh, memory proliferative glomerulonephritis, where it is not associated with the uh, immunoglobulin deposit, but only associated with the complement uh, abnormalities or alternative complement pathway abnormality. So, the classical example is the dense deposit disease. So, these we, we talked about this how immune system immune abnormality cause glomerular injury, but then the glomerular injury has to involve also the components of the glomeruli. So, later they see that what are the cells which are actually cause damage to the glomeruli or what are the soluble mediators that causes damage to the glomeruli. The cells which is causes a uh, lot of damage is neutrophil. See any immune complex if it gets deposited in the sub endothelial side, so naturally these the neutrophil comes to remove them and if the immune complex is very small amount uh, many times in case of say self resolving post infectious glomerulonephritis, the circulating immune complex in the sub endothelial side can be removed by this neutrophil. And in that situation if you get a biopsy of the kidney and see under microscope you can see the neutrophil coming and uh, in, in, in close association with the endothelial area and maybe they are removing all these immune complex deposits. Similarly, other cells which can come into the glomeruli are monocyte, macrophages, T lymphocyte, the natural killer cells, platelets in exudative glomerulonephritis they can form thrombi, they can activate more pro inflammatory uh, pathways and resident glomerular cells especially mesangial cells, mesangial cells are derived from the mononuclear macrophage system. So, in a inflammatory situation sometimes they can also produce the pro inflammatory cytokine and cause more injury. Now, there are soluble factors like uh, the complement components now like C 5 A is a highly chemotactic for the neutrophil and similarly the eicosanoids, nitric acid, uh, nitric oxide, the angiotensin and endothelin. There are several cytokines which cause glomerular injury in MCP 1, Rantis. PDGF and TGF beta and fibroblast growth factor. In fact, many of them are pro inflammatory, many of them are pro healing. The pro healing causes fibrosis. Now, as I told as I we have seen, if there is fibrosis in the glomerulus, it cannot be revert back. So, if there is a, a TGF beta up regulation, it can cause the more fibrosis to the glomeruli. And in fact, that that obviously cause the glomerular injury. It, it will it will fail to reverse back the normal glomerular structure and function. Similarly, coagulation factors can be activated in pro inflammatory conditions and that can cause glomerular injury. Now, with this let us now come to next phase of proliferative glomerulonephritis. As, as we uh, initial uh, the introduction I mentioned that the cell types according to cell types you can classify proliferative glomerulonephritis. So, there is mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis, crescentic glomerulonephritis which is mostly associated with the podocyte proliferation and then uh, the endothelial uh, proliferation leads to endocapillary uh, proliferative glomerulonephritis. There may be membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis where both the glomerular base, base membrane abnormality and mesangial abnormality can be superimposed. Now, we come to the another very important one the post infective glomerulonephritis. Now, here the infectious agents are most common in, in inciting antigen associated with immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis. The post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is the most common form of glomerulonephritis in children 
and it occurs following a skin or pharyngeal infection with the group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Now, the post streptococcal is the commonest. I have used the term post infectious coronavirus. So, it includes streptococcus along with other infection. You have to realize that infection other than streptococci are also increasing in the incidences. So, there may be other uh, bacterial infection, viral, parasitic, rickettsial, and fungal infection can also give rise to this post infectious proliferative coronavirus. Now, the precise nature of the antigen involved in the formation of this nephrotogenic immune complex is unknown. There are certain evidence that streptococcal antigenic substance have been detected in the glomeruli and circulating immune complex have been detected in some patient. Since streptococcal antigen do not always cause disease, other mechanism may be involved including the alteration of these immunoglobulin IgG or glomerular component making them more immunogenic. So, so more it has got a complex structural alteration antigen derived from the infectious agent may bind to the glomerular structure it become a planted antigen in the glomerulus and it, it can uh, give rise to the in situ the immune complex formation which I have already discussed. Now, this is the typical uh, the photomicrograph uh, of a glomerulus if you see this glomerulus is totally bloodless I have shown you the other glomerulus here you can see the capillaries are wide open you can see the capillary lumen here you cannot see any capillary you cannot see any capillary lumen. So, this kind of full bloodless glomeruli are typically example of these acute diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis and if you see very carefully you can see there are lot of neutrophils lot of neutrophils which are coming in the uh, glomerular capillary. So, this is a the exudative type I mean the lot of neutrophils are coming up. So, this is typically a diffuse endocapillary uh, proliferation proliferative glomerulonephritis which is exudative also. And clinical presentation obviously in these cases will be acute nephritic nephritic syndrome and this is obviously antibody mediated pathogenesis and may be either circulating an, an antigen or the planted antigen. If you do the immunofluorescence microscope you typically see immune complex deposit of these IgG and C3 some are large deposit some are small deposits coarse deposit and they are typically described as a starry sky appearance and deposits are there in the capillary wall as well as in the mesangium. And so, <coughs> the, the this typical uh, deposits when we see under EM so you can see that this is the epithelial side and this is the endothelial side there are the neutrophils which are coming up to remove the, the immune complex deposit from the endothelial side, but the epithelial side you typically see this electron dense hump formation. So, electron dense humps or these are typical the uh, diagnostic electron microscopic feature of the post infectious or post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. The clinical course, so the acute nephritic presentation how they behave usually they are more common in children primary disease of children and 6 to 7 years of age and onset is usually abrupt and with a latent period of 7 to 21 days between infection and the development of nephritis. So, so this is important, so there is a there is a gap between incidence of infection and development of the glomerulonephritis. During epidemic the clinical attack rate is around 10 to 12 percent but subclinical diseases occur four times more frequently than over diseases. So, many of them children they may develop a mild proteinuria, mild hematuria and uh, not much other systemic manifestations they do not come to the, the clinics or hospital. Now, the common initial clinical manifestations are uh, hematuria microscopic sometimes macroscopic also edema hypertension and oliguria typical nephritic syndrome and acute clinical episodes of post epidemic is usually self limited mostly they are self limited and complement level returns to normal within 6 weeks. When there is acute proliferative exudative phase uh, if you uh, the uh, <coughs> examine the uh, serum C3 level it uh, may be low, but it comes back to normal within 6 weeks and most patients immature disappear by 6 months, but proteinuria may persist for 1 to 2 years in one third of the patients. So, that is why this is the typical course of the post infectious coronavirus after post infectious we enter into another immune complex associated glomerulonephritis which is very important that is IgA nephropathy. IgA nephropathy is uh, first described in 1968 and is the most common form of primary glomerulonephritis in the world and it is very important it is the most common form of primary glomerulonephritis in the world. And it is an antibody mediated glomerular disease in which the immune deposits localize to the mesangium. So, mostly they deposit in the mesangium and it is not certain whether the deposit form in situ or from circulating immune complexes. This is the typical the uh, photomicrograph of a glomerulus 
if you see there is increase in the mesangial matrix and as well as the increase in mesangial cellularity normally they are I think 4 to 8 cells apart mesangial area. If you do immune, immune immunofluorescence study you can see there is immune complex deposit of IgA and C3 complement in the mesangial area. So, they are all mesangial area and not much in the capillary wall. So, that is in majority of the cases you can get also sometimes in the capillary wall and if you do the silver stain. So, there are hardly any thickening of this basement membrane you can see there is hyper mesangial cellularity. Now, the patient with IgA nephropathy usually present with one of the three syndrome either they can present with microscopic or macroscopic hematuria upper respiratory infection so called the synpharyngetic hematuria. So, the difference clinical difference between post infectious gomonephritis and IgA nephropathy clinical presentation is that that in case of IgA nephropathy it is a synpharyngetic. So, there is infection in in concurrent with hematuria. So, that is why clinically you can suspect these cases this most likely suffering from the IgA nephropathy and asymptomatic microscopic hematuria and variable proteinuria that can be presentation. Sometimes it has got a systemic manifestation of henoxcol and purpura and uh, where most frequently children it is than the adult patients with henoxcol and purpura manifest with skin, joint and interstellar involvement. So, it is become a systemic disaster with IgA. The renal function progressively worsened in approximately 40 percent of these patients. Earlier when it was described it was thought to be a more benign course. Now, we know that Ig nephropathy is uh, not at all a benign uh, disease uh, the 40 percent of this patient may have a very aggressive disease about half of whom reach the end stage renal failure after 20 years of clinically apparent disease. So, it is a progressive disease nearly 30 percent of the patient exhibit a benign course and with chronic microscopic hematuria a normal serum creatinine and proteinuria usually less than 1 gram per day hypertension is not uncommon and malignant hypertension develop about 5 percent of this patient. So, clinically Ig nephropathy uh, may have a significant uh, damage. So, the uh, after Ig nephropathy we enter into another proliferative gononephritis which is the membrano proliferative gononephritis. Now, the membrano proliferative gononephritis or mesangiocapillary gononephritis is a chronic progressive gononephritis that occurs in older children in adult. Now, the circulating immune complex have been identified 50 percent of these patients and activation of the complement system with hypocomplementemia is the hallmark of these membrane proliferative gononephritis. Nowadays, membrane proliferative gononephritis has become much more complex after our knowledge of the involvement of abnormality of the complement system which can morphologically give rise to a membrane proliferative picture. But anyway still the, the, uh, the current textbook what uh, is there. So, we will be going to that line and near future I will be adding that what are the exploration which is happening. The classically MPGN has been uh, several distinct histopathology and, and immunopathologic features three variant have been described they are type 1 MPGN, type 2 MPGN and type 3 MPGN. Now, the they are characterized by alteration in the glomerulus membrane proliferation of the glomerular cells and leukocyte infiltration MPGN accounts for 10 to 20 percent of the cases of nephrotic syndrome in children and in young adults and often present with a combined nephrotic nephrotic syndrome and may have a primary or secondary MPGN. There may be several infection which can give rise to the MPGN and primary MPGN divided into type 1 and type 2 morphologically the glomerular enlarged, hypocellular and lobulated. So, that means, among the proliferative glomerulonephritis in, in post infective glomerulonephritis we do not see much the thickening of the wall of the glomerulus whereas, in MPGN obviously, the proliferation associated with the marked thickening of this uh, wall. And the glomerular capillary wall has a double contour or tram track appearance caused by duplication of the glomerular basement membrane with mesangial and monocyte interposition. And in case of type 1, the subendothelial electron dense deposit can be seen under electron microscope, and under the light microscope, we can see the deposits of C3 and often associated with immune complex like IgG. There may be C1Q and C4 also. So, that means both the complement pathway activated along with Im Im immune complex deposit. So, nowadays there may be <coughs> when we see these uh, the uh, MPGM normally after immunofluorescence microscopy we classify them as the immune complex mediated MPGN and other is the complement mediated MPGN. In the other category which is typically present as type 2 MPGN here the lamina densa is extremely electron dense. So, they look like a dense deposit and that is why we termed as dense deposit disease there is only C3 deposit in the GBM and mesangium and uh, the IgG is usually absent. 
So, here that is why this is not immune complex mediated MPGN. So, this is only the complement mediated MPGN. So, that is why the, the broad classification of MPGN on the basis of immunofluorescence microscopy is becoming much more important nowadays and we are classifying the immune complex mediated MPGN versus the complement mediated MPGN. Now, the pathogenesis <coughs> of the type 1 is that the deposition of the immune complex with activation of the both classical and alternative complement pathway. So, immune complex is the hallmark and the antigens involved in the primary MPGNs are unknown. Whereas, in type 2 MPGN the serum C3 is low, there are the C3 associated factor B, protein, and normal the other C1 and CQ activation of upper alternate complement pathway can be seen and more than 70 percent of patients is, is C3 nephritic factor can be there and C3 nephritic factor stabilizing the alternate pathway of the C3, C3 converted and uh, <coughs> a typical picture of these MPGN. And in fact, if you see here there is the mesangial um, expansion with hypercellularity and sometimes you can describe as the lobular accentuation and the, the basal membrane of these glomeruli are markedly thickened and you can see diffusely and it is immune complex mediated disease. <coughs> and the pathogenesis wise see the basically there <coughs> may be the C3 activations which is associated to alternative complement pathway of C3 convertase stabilization and which is associated with the presence of C3 nephrotic factor and this leads to this kind of abnormality associated with the basal membrane thickening and mesangial cell interposition. Now, the secondary MPGN can arise from the chronic immune complex disorder like systemic lupus erythematosus, chronic infection like hepatitis B, hepatitis C and endocarditis and even in HIV, malignancy such as chronic lymphatic leukemia, lymphoma, melanoma can give rise to MPGN like picture. Now, even the hereditary deficiency associated with complement regulatory protein associated with complement pathway abnormality can give rise to MPGN. Clinical course usually follows a slowly progressive relentless course, some patient develop uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis and I think around 50 percent develop the chronic renal failure within 10 years and high incidence of recurrence in transplant recipients particularly with the dense deposit disease. So, wh what is the importance of diagnosing accurately these types of glomerulonephritis? This is very important for long term prognosis determination as well as for transplantation suitability. Many of these glomerulonephritis like dense deposit disease, the it, transplantations are not successful, but they recur very quickly. Similarly, in case of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, the chance of recurrence after transplantations are also high. So, I think this is the schematic diagram of the, uh, the type 1 and type 2. This is the, uh, the intervenous dense deposit which are there here, whereas here there are more of a rough subendothelial deposits are there and both of there there is the have mesangial cell interposition, but in more prominent in type 1 and less prominent in type 2. And this is the uh, the, the typical electron microscopy on this side you can see that there is a continuous electron dense deposit in the intermembranous type. So, this is the um, typical type 2 glomerulonephritis, whereas this is the typical subendothelial deposit in case of type, N, <coughs> type 1 MPGN. Now, what is the clinical course of this uh, MPGN? Acute nephritic and recurrent microscopy hematuria are the most common presentation, sometimes they can have a nephrotic presentation also, nephrotic nephrotic presentation and most patients with type 2 MPGNs are younger 20 years of age and uh, more have a persistent C3 depression and more commonly present with nephritis. Approximately 20 percent of the patients remain stable for many years and median survival free of renal failure ranges from 5 to 10 years. So, they have a little bit of chronic progressive course. Now, after that we enter into the another uh, type of uh, glomerulonephritis that is the rapidly progressive or crescentic glomerulonephritis. It is a not a specific etiologic form of glomerulonephritis and many of the different kind of glomerulonephritis can present as a crescentic form. So, it is characterized clinically by a rapid and progressive loss of renal functions with severe oliguria and usually death can occur from the renal failure within weeks or month if untreated. So, but nowadays with the help of dialysis these patients can be salvaged and survived and uh, divided into three groups based on the immunologic findings type 1 RPGN anti GBM disease with linear deposit of immunoglobulin and C3. In some patients with anti GBM antibody cross react with the pulmonary alveolar basal membrane and then it present as both lung and the renal involvement which we described as the good pasta syndrome. 
And in other etiologies, exposure to virus, solvent and various drugs, uh, the malignancy associated also can be the triggering factor and uh, sometimes they, these patients improve with treatment with plasmapheresis. And then type 2 rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, this is an immune complex mediated disease can be complicated of uh, complication of immune complex nephritis, they, they if you do immunofluorescence we get the deposition of these IgG and C3. So, earlier we have got a linear deposit whereas, here we get a granular uh, pattern of deposit of IgG and C3, these patients are not usually helped by plasmapheresis. So, this is the uh, difference between the type 1 and type 2 are. Uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or crescentic glomerulonephritis. The term RPGN synonymous with rapidly uh, crescentic glomerulonephritis is uh, not favored much, but as the, the still the nephrology books or the clinical uh, books say this for uh, general um, appreciation uh, I am that is why I am mentioning the, the uh, RPGN which indicates the crescentic glomerulonephritis. Now, type 3 RPGN or crescentic glomerulonephritis this is possible immune type. This is a crescentic glomerulonephritis. If you do uh, the uh, um, immunofluorescence microscopy, you do not see significant immune complex deposit. And most of these patients have uh, ANCA. ANCA means the, the auto anti uh, neutrophilic uh, cytoplasmic auto antibody, or there are different forms of ANCA. And the some cases associated with systemic vasculitis also, they have to be investigated for collagen vascular disease. Now, this is the, the summary the type 1 idiopathic or goose pasta syndrome, uh, type 2 is idiopathic post infectious systemic lupus erythematosus, H is henoxone purpura also. So, immune complex mediated associated with the uh, <coughs> uh, RPGN, type 3 is posse immune, ANCA associated idiopathic, there may be Wegner's granulomatosis and microscopic polyarteritis, they are collagen vascular disease. Now, the morphology is the crescent formation. Crescents are formed by proliferation of the parietal cells um, as well as visceral epithelial cells with infiltration of these uh, WBC particularly monocytes. There is fibrin deposition in the Bowman space, EM reveals focal rupture of the glomerular basal membrane. Clinical feature patient present with acute nephrotic syndrome occasionally have nephrotic syndrome, but mostly it is a oligodic phase and acute nephrotic syndrome. And if it is there you have to investigate for ANCA, anti GBM, anti nuclear antibody and that is why you exclude the secondary. Uh, um, uh, type of these uh, crescentic glomerulonephritis and treatment obviously immunosuppression and plasmapheresis particularly of the type 1 amphibian. So, this is the typical picture you can see this is the glomerulus and you can see that this whole crescentic kind of uh, cellular area which is uh, pushing or compressing these uh, glomerular tuft and you can see that there are these are the epithelial cells and also inflammatory cells with some amount of fibrosis. Depending upon the constitution of this crescent, we also classify them as cellular crescent, where mostly it is cells and hardly any fibrosis uh, like this one. And then a fibrocellular crescent, where uh, they, there is a fibrosis takes place along with the cellular element and then fibrous crescent. Fibrous crescent means the whole crescent is replaced by fibrosis. Now, so far as reversibility of this is concerned, if the crescents are cellular, then still it can be reversed, if fibrocellular it is partially reversed, if it is totally fibrous crescent it cannot be reversed. So, that is why it is important also to look into the composition of this crescent. And the, the crescent another morphological point one should remember this the epithelial cell if it is more than 3 layer thick, then we say this is a significant epithelial proliferation and we stamp it as crescent. But mild increase in epithelial cells of 1 or 2 layer usually we do not stamp it as a crescent. So, they can be seen that the focal epithelial cell proliferation and in the EM as I told you then you can sometimes get the rupture of these uh, the Bowman's capsule along with this electron dense deposit in the global level membrane you can see it here. The next category which is focal proliferative necrotizing glomerulonephritis. So, the term itself says that here it is not a diffuse kind of disease less than 50 percent glomerular involved. And this type of GN associated with proliferation of the glomerular cell is restricted to segments and only focal glomerular involved. So, focal segmental proliferative glomerulonephritis and there may be three circumstances where you can get this kind of picture. An early or mild manifestation of systemic disease sometimes in lupus nephritis you can get this kind of or collagen vascular disease you can have this kind of involvement and also sometimes in, in IgA nephropathy also you can have this kind of presentation unrelated to any particular systemic or glomerular disease. And, and also its manifestations are usually mild with only recurrent hematuria and non nephrotic proteinuria. So, this is sometimes overlap with many of the glomerulonephritis which I have already uh, described or we have discussed. Now, this is one say for example, 
Uh, this is the one where a one segment is a hypercellular with the uh, both the endothelial cells and mesangial cells with neutrophil infiltration. So, this is typically a focal proliferative gonadotropic After this, I think there are few little rare diseases which are involved, uh, hereditary disease which can also involve the glomeruli. I mean, uh, this is I am just adding because they are uh, not very rare. You can see these kind of children and in the OPD. So, that is why the one of the important one is the Alport syndrome. This is a hereditary form of glomerulonephritis associated with the accompanied by nerve deafness and various eye disorder. Males tend to be affected more frequently than severely than female. Most patients have an X linked mode of inheritance and but autosomal dominant and recessive patterns also exist. So, morphologically this present as a focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So, this is presentation wise more like a focal segmental glomerulosclerosis sometimes right, the, the, the progressive disease. Many times they can also present with a mild mesangial cellularity, increase in cellularity or even like a minimal change disease. Now, GBM exhibit the irregular areas of thickening and thinning with lamellation and splitting of this lamina densa. So, there is no immune complex deposit in this condition. Pathogenesis, the nephritis related defective synthesis of the glomerular basement membrane. There is abnormality in the alpha 5 chain of the collagen type 4. So, this is the, the molecular abnormality. If your collagen formation is defective, glomerular basement membrane cannot function normally. So, you can get a proteinuria and as well as hematuria. And patients sometimes present with hematuria may have a mild proteinuria. Symptoms appear 5 to 20 years of age and renal failure develops 20 to 50 years of age. So, these has to be differentiated with IG, from the IgA nephropathy, from minimal change disease or otherwise the direct protocytic protocyte uh, damage associated focal segmental glomerulosclerosis because here the abnormality is in the collagen. This is the normal glomerulosal membrane and if you see here you can see the ratified glomerulosal membrane with the thickening areas, uh, thick areas and thin areas and there are also lamellations of the glomerulosal membrane collagen which we describe sometimes basket weaving pattern. And if you see here the glomerular food processes are also to some extent effaced but more major abnormality in the glomerular basal membrane. There is no electron dense deposit. So, this is typically what we see in Alport syndrome. Now, with all these glomerular nephritis, what will happen at the end? The many of them reverse and many of them uh, they do not reverse. So, those which do not reverse, they have a progressive course and it reaches finally in a state where we describe the chronic glomerular nephritis. So, these are end stage glomerular disease as a result of number of specific type of glomerulonephritis. Certain glomerulonephritis are most likely to progress in chronic glomerulonephritis and the other say crescentic glomerulonephritis and as I um, MPGN. So, they progress to chronic glomerulonephritis much faster. Some cases chronic glomerulonephritis arises mysteriously with without any antecedent history. Patient may be subclinical, um, so it did not come to the hospital and he came to the hospital when actually most of the glomerular sclerosis. So, morphologically kidneys are small with a thin cortex and the chronic contracted kidney which when we examine uh, ultrasound is also indication of that person is suffering from chronic kidney disease. It may be chronic glomerulonephritis or chronic pyelonephritis whatever that the or chronic interstitial nephritis which leads to these end stage renal disease. And there is hyaline obliteration of the most of the glomeruli. So, the arterio arteriosclerosis is often prominent and secondary tubular interstitial changes are there everything is fibrosed. Clinical course the chronic glomerulonephritis usually develops insidiously and slowly progressive to uremia and death and often obviously you, you can make this patient survive by transplantation or long continued dialysis often present with non specific complaint. When they present only as a chronic glomerulonephritis we do not know exactly how sometimes what are the primary type of or initial type of glomerulonephritis which leads to chronic glomerulonephritis. So, the patient often detected discovery of the hypertension, proteinuria or agitemia on routine medical examination and dominant clinical manifestations are often the cerebral or cardiovascular because kidney disease was silent. It came when the kidney is totally failed or gone. Now, the this is the, uh, the diagram which shows around 1 to 2 percent of the post nephritis can go to chronic nephritis. Rapidly progressive nephritis almost 90 percent can go if they are not damaged treated or managed properly. Membranous nephritis 50 percent can go to chronic nephritis. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis also 50 to 80 percent will finally lead to chronic nephritis. Membranous nephritis around 50 percent progress to chronic nephritis and IG nephropathy around 30 to 50 percent progress to chronic nephritis. So, you see most of these nephritis. Uh, may have a quite progressive course except the post-apticocal one mostly it is reversible. 
So, this is the typical picture of chronic glomerulonephritis. This is the Mason trichrome stain where the fibrosed area takes the blue stain. You see all these glomeruli are totally knocked out. So, in these uh, almost 80 percent glomeruli are totally sclerose. You can see there is marked uh, the arterial hyaline thickening, arteriosclerotic changes, secondary um, vascular changes are there. And uh, so, so, that leads the end of the glomerulonephritis. Uh, of uh, the different types and how they progress and what happens to the kidney at the end. Uh, I think this summarizes the pathobiology and pathophysiology of the glomerulonephritis along with the clinical correlation and the clinical presentation.